If you've recently spent time in nonprofits or in higher education administration or listening to democratic lawmakers or hanging around certain progressive activists, you're probably aware that equality is out and equity is in. Over the past year, both liberal and conservative media outlets have covered this shift. For example, here's the New Republic, here's the Wall Street Journal, and here's Newsweek. So what exactly is equity and why did our progressive thought leaders collectively seem to give equality the boot? Let's take a look at this explanation by none other than Kamala Harris from the 2020 campaign trail. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. Equality suggests, oh, everyone should get the same amount. The problem with that, not everybody's starting out from the same place. So if we're all getting the same amount, but you started out back there and I started out over here, we could get the same amount, but you're still going to be that far back behind me. It's about giving people the resources and the support they need so that everyone can be on equal footing and then compete on equal footing. Equitable treatment means we all end up at the same place. Now, this video, which we have to admit was a pretty bizarre kind of campaign video, naturally became a perfect opportunity for the right to grind their culture war acts. Tucker Carlson, for one, produced this bizarre rebuttal. What exactly is equity? And how is it different from equality? Equality being the central principle this country was founded on. Well, the first thing to know about equality is that it's designed to challenge power. Equity, by contrast, is designed to protect power. Equity is what the British monarchy had. Equality is what the American colonists wanted. Equality is what allowed Andrew Jackson to rise from a childhood of bitter poverty in the Carolina woods, where he was born in 1867, and make it all the way to the White House. Andrew Jackson was tough, smart, and energetic. He lived a remarkable life, and America rewarded him for it. That's equality. People like that rising to the top. Equity is the opposite. Equity is what allowed Kamala Harris, the privileged child of two PhDs, to stay privileged. And in the end, to become one of the most powerful people on the planet, despite having achieved nothing impressive or worthwhile over the span of 56 years. So Andrew Jackson and Kamala Harris, both Democrats, one the child of equality, the other the child of equity. That's the difference in a nutshell. So to recap, Equality challenges power, equity protects power. So Kamala Harris says that equity is simply getting everyone what they need, whereas Tucker Carlson says that equity is the British monarchy and not Andrew Jackson. Needless to say, both of these definitions of equity are pretty unsatisfying in their own ways, so let's dig a little deeper. Equity most frequently comes up these days in the context of addressing and ameliorating racial disparities. For example, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ibram X. Kendi writes, here's an example of racial inequity. 71% of white families lived in owner-occupied homes in 2014, compared to 45% of Latinx families and 41% of black families. Racial equity is when two or more racial groups are, are standing on relatively equal footing. An example of racial equity would be if there were relatively equitable percentages of all three racial groups living in owner-occupied homes in the 40s, 70s, or better 90s. Let's also take a look at a standard issue definition of equity that you might hear at a diversity training. As it happens, this one isn't totally unlike Kamala Harris's definition, but here's the slightly longer version. Equity can be defined as giving everyone what they need to be successful. In other words, it's not giving everyone the exact same thing. And here's where the difference between equity and equality really come in. Because it's important to remember that if we give everyone the exact same thing, expecting that we'll make people equal, it assumes that everyone started out in the same place. So here's an example. In this instance, we give everyone the exact same box, we treat them with equality, so that they can see over the fence. 
Well, that's great for the person on the left because they were already taller, but it's not so great for the person on the right who still can't see over the fence. From an equity perspective, we wouldn't want everyone to have the same size box because everyone isn't the same height to start out with. With an equity mindset, we would get everyone what they need to raise them up to the same level. Now, this whole analogy with the fence and having to stack up different boxes for different people so they can see over the fence is particularly interesting because we actually already have a policy term for this process. It's called means testing. And I'm far from the first person to say this, but if the whole the, if the whole point with this thought exercise with the boxes and the fence and the people of different heights is to envision a fair society, then instead of wasting time figuring out exactly how many boxes each person needs so they can finally see over the fence, why not just remove the fence? The other problem with progressives trying to swap the word equality for equity is that the proponents of equity seem to offer only the most narrow and pitiful definition of equality, which, if you remember, they say means giving everyone the same thing. Now, of course, even the most cursory overview of American history shows that the concept of equality has been marshaled again and again by people fighting for enfranchisement, civil rights, and an end to slavery and exploitation, among other struggles. So given all of that, why the frantic pivot to equity? In October, the writer John Patrick Leary argued in The New Republic, the fact that so many institutions and politicians prefer equity is a warning sign that it is the more anodyne alternative to equality, one byproduct perhaps of conservatives' long campaign to transform political language to disavow universal social equality and celebrate individual opportunity. See for other successful examples, the death tax or the free market. So I can see his point here. Equity, of course, is also a financial term, so it makes sense that centrist politicians may have initially started using it to sound more palatable, particularly to business interests. But I would also argue that equity has become yet another word for members of the professional class to signal that they're at the vanguard of progressive thought and behavior. Much like saying the word BIPOC, which is a term that isn't used by the majority of people in the US, even the very people it's supposed to refer to, saying equity demonstrates that you got the memo that this, and not equality, is now the word that enlightened people use when they talk about racial or gender disparities. It's also why you hear equity frequently paired with diversity and inclusion, as in diversity, equity, and inclusion, as in the diversity, equity, and inclusion industry, which today is worth well over $8 billion. The trainers and consultants in this vast and growing industry obviously have a financial interest in constantly creating new vocabularies and codes of conduct when it comes to race relations, and then selling their services to train people in learning these new vocabularies. Now, aside from all of that, there's perhaps an even more fundamental reason why elites these days seem to love the concept of equity. The sociologist Dylan Riley wrote last year in the New Left Review that equity happens to be the defining logic of this particular era of capitalism. He writes, multicultural neoliberalism offers a profoundly unequal but rigorously equitable form of capitalism. Social mobility might be low in such a society, but not for illegitimate reasons of race or gender. California offers a template for a capitalist society informed by this logic. This huge and immensely wealthy state has been run for decades by the liberal progressive wing of the Democratic Party. What has its record been? California has an inequality index higher than Mexico, the highest poverty rate in the country, an aging population, a housing market out of reach of most middle and working class people, fewer working class jobs, sorry, and poor public schools. It provides fewer and fewer working class jobs as its industrial structure becomes increasingly concentrated in the glitzy Bay Area Silicon Valley technology hub. This is roughly the model that multicultural neoliberalism offers the US. And just to drive his, his point home further, while the homeless population explodes in California, the cost of living continues to climb and economic inequality continues to spike unchecked, California's Democratic lawmakers have been working overtime to make sure the state's most elite institutions are diverse. I've talked about this in the past, but I think it's worth repeating. As you may have heard, the University of California recently decided to stop using SAT scores in admissions. 
The point of doing this was to help diversify its disproportionately Asian and white student body without running afoul of the California law that explicitly prohibits schools from considering applicants' race in admissions. Now, while diversifying the UC system may sound like an admirable goal, consider the fact that tuition at the University of California has risen significantly over the last several decades. As you can see from this graph, from the California Budget and Policy Center, the average annual tuition at a UC school in 1980 was around $2,000 adjusted for inflation. In 2019, it was over $14,000. To make matters even worse, over the summer, the University of California Board of Regents announced that they had approved a tuition hike for the first time since 2017, set to begin next year. It's no secret that higher education is increasingly unaffordable for the majority of Americans, which means that the push to diversify universities in the face of steeply rising costs is really only a push to diversify a shrinking resource. This is the epitome of equity. Fortunately, there's an alternative to this desiccated, zero-sum form of politics. As Dylan Riley writes, the key planks of Bernie Sanders' platform in 2016 and 2020 included progressive taxation, public infrastructure spending, a national health insurance scheme, and expanded public services. He goes on to say, this is a more substantial project than equity as it seeks to address inequality itself. Strikingly, this too is a redistributive project. Sanders calls insistently for massive material redistribution funded by corporate profits. In other words, we can do so much better than equity. Yeah, uh, that's exactly right. And uh, it's it's so funny, the, the pushback that Sanders would get, for instance, when he would propose universal solutions to these problems, when he would say, you know, every single person deserves to have health care as a human right uh, through a Medicare for all single payer health care system. And people would push back and say, I mean, well, look, you know, sure, I agree, but a uh, universal program, you know, it's that it's that very kind of like it's the Kamala Harris definition of uh, equality where if everyone gives a box thing, to everybody. So, yeah, everyone's getting a little bit higher up. But then, like, you know, you're just preserving inequality. You're just, you know, making the floor a little higher. Um and that's just not how universal programs work at all. <laughs> like it, it's it's saying everyone gets the same. It's like everyone's dolled out a little bit of resource. Here's here's your little resource. Here's your little resource. Everyone gets a little healthcare resource, and uh, and you get just that little bit. And you know that's that's universal. But obviously that's not what it means. It means that uh, everyone, because they are human beings, because they all have the same inherent value as a person. You and I are the same, have the same value as any other person in society. Uh, we say that you should have certain things as a right guaranteed mm -hmm. by society. And mm -hmm. so a universal program, obviously, it might not be, you know, you could, you could imagine it not being universally distributed appropriately, but that's a political question. So what we would say mm -hmm. is because every single person has inherent value, for a program to actually be universal, you're going to have to, you know, more resources might have to go into parts of the country, certain zip codes that have been dramatically underfunded for decades and decades. Um, and that's the only way to actually achieve something like a universal program. Uh, but like, that's, that's both like, normatively, way more fair, it just, it's like, yeah, it's principally way more correct and, and fair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but it also is like politically more viable it's like yeah. having coalitions and politically more durable yeah yeah i mean that's really why i wanted to bring up the point about means testing right like when i was watching all of these equity videos and there were you know all of these analogies with like the boxes or whatever i think kamala's video had like different little cartoon people like struggling to reach a rope or something and this this um just what you were saying, this rhetoric of like, oh, well, you know, based on where everybody is at, we need to give them, we need to give some people like a little more of this and other people like shouldn't get a box at all. And I was like, wait, that's means testing, you yeah. know, it, and, and, you know, to go back to the Bernie Sanders campaign, it reminded me a lot of when Hillary Clinton was like, I don't want to pay for Donald Trump's kids to go to college. Right. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of good commentary in Jacobin and other left outlets about how, um, kind of disingenuous that framing is, because what you're really trying to say, I mean, we all know that means testing is the thing that uh, guts programs, it makes them unpopular, it makes mm -hmm. them hard to use, and ultimately it makes them weaker to attacks from the right and from capitalists. So, uh, you know, 
equity, I think, uh, you know, being framed as something that is, as you were saying, kind of kind of being positioned as the opposite of a universal program, I think just makes it uh, dead in the water to me. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.